you know what's nice is it doesn't hurt our friendship. Yeah, I don't think it really matters. I don't think it helps or hurts. I mean, it's, maybe it helps yeah. in a sense that it makes you feel closer and you're in the trenches working with somebody on a record. But just because we haven't had a record in seven years, we speak fairly a lot. Sort yeah. Of, we're sort of daily communicators with each other on the minutia of life. Yeah, it's just, we feel like it's more of a blessing to get to do it together whenever it does happen. Did you feel like you were imposing early on? Did it feel a little bit weird to sort of... Is it weird sort of being uh, like... A, um, I never thought of it that like way. Kind of like a ringer. No, but I I do think it's cool to think of yeah. myself as, as a, ringer. a ringer. My yeah. brother Dan Divine writes for the website The, the Ringer. ringer. Yeah. yeah, I no, I think because I think because we very literally started playing music with each other within weeks of meeting mm. on a tour we were both on. Um, it was Manchester. It was my band, and it was brand new. And we were doing. I really think by the time we got to like the West Coast. I was playing guitar on the whole Manchester set. No, I don't think it took that long. I Might think even it was like, like the show Midwest. Five. Yeah. I think by Chicago, it, it became obvious that you, you were going to play. And I remember... <laughs> you uh, were sort of infringing. You were kind of like slowly... One more song a night. No, we yeah. just asked. I mean, there's yeah. nothing better for an opening band than to have, you know, somebody in the bands playing later, like playing with you and, yes. and, and making, you know, a thing out of it. It's like... It's very cool. Instant stamp of approval. And that, that, that tour was full of that, every like cross pollinating or whatever. And that was the first time you guys had really sort of met or We literally, the, the very beginning of March 2007, the tour started the middle of March 2007. You were in New York hang, doing stuff for Manchester. And yeah, I think we were meeting labels. And you so were, like we were just like going up and meeting certain like yeah, record. You were like people. 19, 21, 20? No, not 21. Yeah, because November. So you were 20. So it was 20. And you were with Jess. Mm -hmm. And we met up and like just drove around in his mom's minivan, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Yeah. And then went to the first thing that this is real. The first thing. This that, is really wholesome so far. Yeah, it's really cool. Well, it gets more wholesome. We went to Max Brenner, the chocolate man oh, yeah. in Union Square. But we, I think the first thing I ever said to Andy was, do you like it here? What do you think of the city? Your first time this in New first York? first time here, yeah. And you were like, no, dude, this is my first time. Like the buildings and this, like this, the pace or whatever. It's a lot, whatever it was. And you I was were overwhelmed. Like, well, I was fucking with him. He was totally um, fucking with <laughs> me. But he was so earnest in the delivery. These buildings are too large. But this isn't revisionist. This is true. Yeah. In that moment when you said that that way and then... You you flipped it. I literally was like, oh, I'm going to be friends with this guy because the tonality, it's so rare that someone does that that well. And when that someone early. does it that well, you're like, oh, this dude's like my kind. Yeah. You know uh, what I, I mean? my like, response was something like, uh, you said, is this your first time in the city? I was like, yeah, man, I'm just amazed at the buildings. Yeah. No, no, it's not my first time in the city. <laughs> yeah. Where are we going? And I was like, <laughs> oh, this guy's fucking great. Also, it was like you were like 20 and 50 when you said that. <laughs> That's funny. And we went to Tower Records. We, we did go to Tower shopping. Records, which is that. Those are all dead now. Yeah. But we did go. That's right. It was like a two-story Tower Records. On we, West, on East 4th Street. Yeah. I was going to say that. Like on East 4th Street. <laughs> I don't know where we were. But yeah, yeah we, and we just, we talked about music. And I think a lot of funny conversations between me and you have happened in record stores early on. I remember. Like, mm -hmm. I remember being on tour then months later and us being in Seattle and going to Amoeba. Or right? no, San Francisco. Yes. And going to Amoeba. And both of us are like walking down the aisles. A funny thing. We don't ever talk about ever. But you went, it's funny, man. Like I can be in here and all I end up looking for is like Nirvana in utero. Like, I you bought just... that record, no joke, 20 different times. Totally. You, just want, you wanted an $18 copy of in utero. <laughs> Sometimes a $3 copy from the used bin. Because I'm just yeah, like, you oh, just you know what I really want to listen to? You know, yeah. Right? yeah. I want to listen to either or again. Totally. Yep. <laughs> That's it. I found XO in a, a used bookstore in Lilburn, Georgia, right next to our uh, high school. That's how I That's heard. That's the first time you... Well, I, no, I heard Needle in the Hay mm -hmm. from Royal Ten Tenenbaums. Bums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I was 16, I guess. Mm -hmm. It was like, this guy's... This or 15, is, I was earlier. I that's, a sweet, that's a sweet spot right there to really get hard into Elliot Smith. Certainly, yeah. And then I had a guy older in my life that was mm -hmm. helping like engineer some stuff. And he showed me a bunch of things like the Tremoke Hotel and Weaker Vans. Mm -hmm. you know, I never heard mm -hmm. like those bands before. But I remember seeing that XO and then buying it. And then being sort of blown away. And the last track would always skip. Oh, you know, the one. Like, yeah, it was like the bookstore. Yeah, yeah, version. yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. The song that I did on the Elliott Smith podcast. Which now, I, you know, you sing to the kid. Mm -hmm. And his songs are soft. So they've mm -hmm. always been songs I've sang to her. And now she asks to hear them. And I have to like do edits over the cursing. Yeah, that's right. But nice. she asked to hear 
I sang that song to her the other night and now every day she's like, every day, Mm -hmm. she's like, I want to hear Waiting for the Bus. And so I sing that song and then she goes, I want to hear Waiting for the Train. And so we have this like split single Elliot Smith public transit thing between those two songs. That's awesome. Yeah. I wish I can't get that cool with Maisie at all. Like I, I try. No, I don't think ever. Never. <laughs> it's like discovering the Beatles when you're younger and then growing up and like realizing like what you were listening to. There's that extra level. The Beatles and Dylan were like that for yeah. me. They were like my mom's music. Yeah, and then yeah. stuff too, like James Taylor or Jackson mm-hmm. Brown or but those two in particular, I remember like having my own moment at 17 or 18 actually weirdly the beatles one came in through there was a hardcore kid brian cavalone now his name is bricks avalon he lives in louisville and he came to see our show there when we were there last year whenever that was or something with alex g okay he was one of those guys that like played me yeah. stuff and i was in his house and he played me god mm. from the plastic ono band record and i was like what is this and he was like it's john lennon and john lennon in my head was you know, yeah. like elvis right or, or whatever, or Michael J. I don't know. And I was like, this is John Lennon? Like, this is heavy? Like, what? And Mother, the screaming stuff. And then that got me back into the Beatles like, mm. as a kid who was listening to Nirvana and Sonic Youth and Pavement and whatever the hell else. And I was like, oh, the Beatles are fucking great. <laughs> See, it's funny because I never, my parents never listened to the Beatles. Mm-hmm. I never heard the Beatles. Really? I mean, other than... Uh, you have, have, by now, at this point in your life, no. I've heard the Beatles? I, I mean, I've heard it's great, uh, but I've never actually heard it. No, there was a moment, <laughs> uh, it was that same guy. It's like, I, the very end of American Beauty, mm. Elliot Smith covers a Beatles tune. And I, it's sort of the same because? guy. Because? Because, yeah. Yeah. because. yeah. And then realizing that that was... My very first Beatles record that I was like given by that same guy, I was like, you should actually check out the albums. Because my parents, that was way more James Taylor... Jackson Brown, mm-hmm. um, Chicago, mm-hmm. the Firm soundtrack, which was just piano. Like Dad had a very eclectic, That's but very killer. similar. It was just he crazy. had five CDs, yeah. but they were an eclectic five CDs. It's, yeah, enough. Actually, the biggest argument I ever had with my dad was when I was a kid, like sixteen, seventeen. I'm starting to realize, you know, as somebody who believes in God, I'm starting to realize that like um, all of this is amazing, and all of this is like glorifying to some sort of. Uh, Creator, Wait, just the existence in general, the existence of music that mm. being a kid who was brought up in church was told was evil. Got it. Which isn't evil, but it's like, oh wow, no, it's all glorious. You no, know, I remember just my dad going. Time magazine said Sgt. Pepper's is drenched in drugs. And me looking at him going, you're not, you don't get it. What are you talking about? You don't get it, dude. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's since gotten it, you know, which is really That's lovely. Great. It's a nice little. I'm sure he's probably gotten a lot of things mm. through you, no doubt. Yeah. Through your passage through the world. And vice versa. For right, sure. That, right. But it's kind of cool when it starts to cycle. It becomes reciprocal. Sure. Because I think like my, my mom was like Brooklyn, Irish Catholic hippie. Mm. You know, my dad was a, a generation older. She's maybe a little lapsed by the time you came along. She's, I think a lot of Northeastern Catholics have like a buffet style approach sure. to their, their Catholicism. And I think my mom, like, I don't know if I would say, I think my mom is very much, my mother can tell me if I'm wrong mm-hmm. when she hears this, but I think that she's very much a believer, I would say. But I think that she's also somebody who, I guess maybe there's some non-traditional aspects it's to that, like how that new moves around. Her approach. Well, she's not a hippie that way now. Yeah. She's the new, I think she kind of actually is like a person who would, um, I think she'd probably roll her eyes at certain new agey things. She's still like a person from the outer boroughs of New York yeah. City. There was Beatles and Phil Oaks and Dylan and, and Buffy St. Marie and what's her name? Carly Simon, Joni yeah. Mitchell. I heard all of that stuff, but I remember like, and so we agreed on like R.E.M. Oh, that's we agreed nice. on like the first Counting Crows record, but when I went with Nirvana, she, she was like, this is just a guy screaming nonsense. Right. And then when the Unplugged came out, she was like, Oh, a genius. they're Beatles songs. He does a Lead Belly song. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. also like you break down those songs and they're either like children's songs or they are him singing his version of the pop songs by Nirvana mm-hmm. are kind of Beatles songs with weird, his own weird thing going on. Um, My but mom that was, was similar too. Like there was that moment where she started showing me things. She's like, she'd go like, uh, Dave, she knew I loved the Foo Fighters and loved Nirvana. So she'd go like, you know, Dave Grohl, who's the drummer. Nirvana. I go, yeah, yeah. I'm aware. His favorite band, 
he just said this thing. Like she, my mom's always been very tech savvy. You know, like she could, she's mm. always, if I have a problem with my Mac, I still call my mom <laughs> and she go like, let's break it down. That like, is it's crazy. Incredible. It's wild. She's very good at all of it. Just an artist's mind and an artist's heart. She's like, you she know, writes. Dave Grohl's favorite band is this band called My Morning Jacket. And I was in the ninth grade going like, ah, oh, mom, I don't want to hear it. You know, and meanwhile. That's so great. Your mom turned you on to my morning jacket. She tried, and then I refused. And then it was years no. later. It's like that sort of thing. Mom would like normal, and she still does. The other day I was sitting on their porch, and she's like, I told her about someone who had reached out to me on Instagram. It was an artist and an up and coming successful singer songwriter. And they were asking me for advice. Just like, what do you do? You know? And I was telling her, I was like, you know, this is what I said to him. Do you think it's okay? And she's like, I sent you his song like six months ago. Shut up. Yeah. She's like, do I annoy you? And I do it. I said, sometimes it is a little much to go like, you'll really love this song. I'm just like, not in the place to hear it. And it's been that way for the last 18 years that she will show me something. I'll not be into it. And then eventually, I'm like, you were right. But that's really specific that she shows you things that are current. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, she listens. I don't, my mom and I don't really have the same current musical taste. Something changed at some point for her, and there's stuff that I'm like, that's not really my thing. Totally. But the stuff that my mom liked from 1955 mm-hmm. to 1980 unassailably cool (laughs) that stuff I'm like you know but I love the idea of you being 14 and your mom going hey have you heard my morning jacket this record sounds like shit yeah that's amazing it's not cool oh that's so good it's like hey have you tried drugs yet yeah totally 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 yeah yeah. it's like mom newfound glory is actually really cool (laughs) no offense still and I'm taking I'm taking so are they I mean peace I suspect that the parents are pretty reasonably on board with with your own music oh my god yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. biggest supporters really i mean from my angle it's like they couldn't be happier my dad loves just loves it just yeah it's really it's really great no my parents are that way too my dad passed in 2003 Mm -hmm. but before like by that point i'd made a record called uh make the clocks move and and my old band had made our last record and my dad used to come to like the lower east side and he was like six three three hundred pounds and would like go to pianos or mercury lounge or cbgb's Mm -hmm. and like watch us play yeah people would be like and people loved it they're like yo your fucking dad is here you know and he would be like this it was like he's not supposed to be there uh (laughs) My mom still comes sometimes, and uh, but before he passed, and we were playing him, there was like some countryish music on that Make McGlory, or like you know whatever the hell yeah. kind of indie country thing was moving around. And he was like, "That song sounds like it should be played at the Grand Old Opry." Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like he actually listened to it. There's a lot of like terrible rock music, rap music, every kind of music. Sure. There's a lot of terrible country music, but the country music that is good, that's good, yeah, is so good. Yeah, it, it's it's up there. If you take like yeah, your best like Willie Nelson mm-hmm. song, it's the same way. You know, like I tell you a lot that I think like the Motown era, like that soul music, oh God. has an argument to be the greatest music that's ever sure. been made and may never be made as great or as passionately again. I totally agree with that. There was a funny thing though, like with my mom, she had a pastor and we talk about it like that told all, it was this age during the south where it was like burn your records you know, yeah, like, yeah 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 you know, and bring your stuff and so she would bring like first edition led zeppelin albums and, and burn them mm-hmm. and the, the dopest thing about my mom since then is that she has reclaimed all of them yeah. she's found that's cool. every album and she has them all in her vinyl collection now from that thing but i kind of grew up in a little bit of that like her being a 30 year old woman trying to do the right thing, mm. you know, mm-hmm. for her kids and not really knowing what was up. And so we were stuck in like Shania Twain country mm. where I mm-hmm. think secretly at night, if there was like Spotify, she would be going back and like listening you know, mm-hmm. to the dope stuff that mm-hmm. didn't exist. So you just kind of had what was on the, the radio. That's kind of beautiful actually. Mm-hmm. And it's funny too, with the Motown thing, just made me think of like at some point three years ago, probably on the instigator tour, I started to have, and it's, I haven't stopped it yet. I might never stop it, but I started to just have the front of house play Sam Cooke. Yeah. It was just like, just only, they were like Sam Cooke radio. I was like, no, 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 just Sam Cooke. the best of Sam it's Cooke. It's though. You really want to come on after Sam Cooke? No, but what I will say is I'd rather do that than come on after insert emo pop sure. punk indie rock band here yeah. over which I have no control you just send the bar pretty high <laughs> yeah, yeah but Sam that's Cook. even better yeah. and also my, the thing with yeah, yeah the Sam Cooke thing was also like who the hell doesn't ever want like sure. no one ever walks in a room and hears like you send me and goes like the vibe in here sucks yeah <laughs> You know, like you walk in, and you're like, oh, I want to be here for. Yeah, used hours. to Manchester used to do just strictly Ghostface. 
That's killer. So no pun intended. Yeah. From the time the doors opened and then when we finish, it's ghost face again. And it felt, made us feel good. Like, that's the you point. Know, that's yeah. The point. Yeah. Like back there going like, oh, There's something to be said for playing something kind of as far musically from what you're doing on stage, right? I mean, you don't want like a really good version of what you do to be playing. Right or a really bad version sure. of, well, two things. Well, that's not fair. A version with which you don't identify, sure. mm-hmm. let's say that, or a version of something that maybe it was very diplomatic. A well-meaning promoter might think yeah. you are in the same world as, but you may not think you are in the same world as. I don't really want to have like the greatest pop punk hits of 2011 looping while I'm playing a solo show. You and I were together when Manchester played. You opened up for us at Toad's Place last year. Yeah. Almost a year ago. Almost missed the show. Yeah, almost missed the show. Mm-hmm. Um, due to those, uh, what did you get a boot, a boot on my yeah, car? On the car. Yeah. But I remember our sound guy had his Spotify linked up and he <laughs> and his wife's Spotify were linked up and she started listening to Manchester and it switched the house music in the house <laughs> to like a song from Black Mile. And we're like calling, we're like, can we please turn our music yeah. off of the front of house thing? That's like, that's like when you, when you're on a Skype call and you can hear your own voice on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most distracting thing in the world. That is also kind of sick. Like, think, yeah, that know. is a pretty baller move, in a right? Different well, yeah, like in hip hop. No, I'm sure. sure. I've seen it. So when we did the Blink One Eight Two Civic Tour, <laughs> no. on the Civic Tour, the house music was Blink One Eight Two. Do you think they requested amazing. that specifically? I don't know. Maybe they have think, no I idea. Or, I mean, they had to have an idea, but it was sort of like getting everybody ready. Here I can see Travis Hunter like having that on his rider. Yeah. Right? He was a very kind guy. I have, I, I have nothing but amazing things to say about Travis Barker. That's great. Sweet guy. This actually breaks us, I think, to an interesting point with the, the new record and what you guys do when you get into a room and, and collaborate. I mean, how much of it is really kind of meeting in the middle? I mean, obviously, you've got largely different styles when you're making your own records. It's funny because I guess I don't think about... I don't know that I think about this stuff this way till we start talking about it. Right, yeah. It sort of makes you evaluate it. Talk talk about it from the standpoint of like, hey, it's time to get in a room and make a record again? No, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, almost like we start talking about it after it's been done, which is a good thing because it it, kind of prompts me to reflect about it. I kind of think by, I don't know, I kind of feel like by its nature, the thing is us Mm -hmm. meeting in the middle. But what we often are meeting in the middle with are like arms full of pretty developed songs close to yeah that we then build out with our each of our specific things yep. and so that's why to me like the magic trick of any of these records is that like they don't especially sound like Manchester Orchestra or Kevin Divine records mm-hmm. obviously it's very legible that we're in there I don't yeah. mean like it's but I mean like you're not masking no but it's not tr- the way we treat it I think whatever happens the alchemy that happens with the with and then with the band the larger band and particularly Robert it just ends up being this thing that's its own and is like justified and existing on its own mm-hmm. it doesn't it's not like it doesn't just feel to me like cast offs from a Manchester or Kevin record no it feels like its own animal well and also i think because we really care about it That's like you know we, like <laughs> you know we 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 have uh pride in in our first two albums that we made and in, in whatever way that they were made so when it came to this it was like yeah there was a deep i care about this record just as much as i care about any yes. other record i've made but it's nice i will say just the, the the biggest difference is having somebody else to hold the weight with like and Robert is certainly there holding the weight with us on this album mm-hmm. and is even uh, as big a part in Manchester if not bigger of helping me hold that weight but there's something nice about it where I know that this is this is a combination of what we do are you pushing yourself though to do something different because it is a different configuration I mean yeah I don't think we would have made a record the way this record sounds after making two kind of indie pop records right that would i guess i just mean from the standpoint of like hey we're working with somebody different you know than the usual you know your your projects what What i would say about that for for me you mean like when i so am i um, am i mindful of like not just approaching it the way i would approach my own sure yeah yeah well absolutely there's two things and it's they're to me they're great things one is I run a fairly, you live in your own head and you're your own, um, when you're your own editor and yep. your own quality control. 
I think for my standards with my songwriting, mm-hmm. I run it. I'm fairly like hard on myself. I want, I don't, not much gets past that. I, that doesn't mean anybody else is going to like it or not like it, but I sure. don't put stuff it's out. It's your name on the like. product. Right. But I also with bad books, I know I'm in the room with another person who I assess to be, besides being one of my closest friends in the world, like somebody who's a motherfucker, is a songwriter, a performer. So you want to like, you want to share the weight, but you also yeah. want to like hold your water too. You know what I mean? You don't want to be like somebody who's like, I think he and I push each other to be really good mm-hmm. with one another and also to like make what each of us does better and more interesting and compelling because I want to like, I want to make sure I belong in the room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And is, I it, also, is it competitive? I wouldn't say competitive in the way that that word gets used. It's competitive in the way that like you don't want to get smoked by the dude you're making the record with. So it's like that's that thing we talked about and I'll shut up. But about like when I told you about Bazan said that thing about like winning. Mm -hmm. It was never to him like I want to I want to beat him. It was like he would watch someone play a song he thought was great and be like he just won. Yeah. I want to win too. Right. You know what I mean? And I think that we drive each other to want to win in that way and yes. i want to win with you right. you also don't want to be the five tracks on the record that people skip to get to the other sets. No, and we are going to delete my five tracks so <laughs> okay. we're just talking about so that so it's an ep that. now officially yeah. well they'll get to they'll tell you about that but yeah, yeah. <laughs> i kind of approach it the same way that i approach everything else yes. in a sense that like it's got to be really really great um so that's sort of the only way I, I I look at it. It's like if what what we do needs to be really excellent, so we're gonna do everything that we can to make it excellent. That's it. And then we normally land somewhere around our mental paths, thinking it's excellent. Right, that's good. Yeah. 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 It's 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 a great burden to have because it's it's a big puzzle, ultimately trying to figure out what an album is and yeah. how it all works together. And especially since you know you are coming from two different places, and it sounds like. For the beginning part of the process, you're relatively solitary for the songwriting. For the songwriting aspect, yes. But in the, in the same sense, we know that we're going to come together and do something together. So you can start to put stuff aside and go like, here's what's going to end up becoming mm-hmm. a part of that. Mm-hmm. This record, a little different. It wasn't exactly... This record was like a pop quiz. That's right. You were kind of like, what do you got? Yeah. And I remember thinking like, do I have anything? Like in that, I have like a blackout moment sometimes when uh-huh. people ask me shit like that. And I was like, no, you have songs. Just yeah, playing the songs. Five. Yeah. I think, and there was even another one we might've gone through that ended up on one of the splits, but there was, yeah, that this record, it was kind of more like we got in a room and Andy was like, what, what if we tried to, instead of doing one song, we recorded like an album in the next three days, meaning the bones of it. And maybe mm-hmm. the bones of it were the record. Maybe it was a, uh, like we keep talking about the basement tapes or something like just yeah. put a mic in a room and go. Mm-hmm. So we sat down and showed each other at that point, 11 songs, six and five. You can't see that if I just pointed at Andy and then pointed at myself from that point, kind of like started to pick apart whether or not there was a record in there. Yes. There wasn't an expectation leading up to it that there would necessarily be a full album. Not no, not at all. Weekend. No, not at all. We thought there would be a song. We thought we would start one full band song mm-hmm. and see what happens next. And I like the idea of getting in a room and stuff seeming impossible to do. I like yeah. sort of setting up the mountain and going like, we could do that, right? It's like a musical escape room. In a, in a way. <laughs> yeah, it's a good way to put it. It's like, how, to, how, how are we going to figure this out? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we loved the bones of it so much that it then we just kept working on it, working on it. So you each away. sort of come with a notebook? Not at all. No? <laughs> a laptop or a okay. phone sometimes. Yeah. That first session, though, I really think we just kind of like... What do you have? Yeah. And then I did like... I think we might have gone back through some notes and been like, oh, that, that's, there's that thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like you were playing before, again, that they were relatively fully formed when you brought them into the room. Well, the songs... When I say fully formed, yeah. what I mean by that is like the basic structure of a song that I could like sit down and play mm-hmm. you. That doesn't mean it in yeah. its final form necessarily. Yeah. I'd but I'd say it means... they were like 50% there. The song's there. The, the bones of the song were there. But then it was about figuring out how to make that song. How do you translate how that? How does that become that song? Yes. It, it's, it's clear to you which of the things that you've 
kind of been working on or have pieces of would make sense in this context or do you really kind of cycle through everything you've been working on i mean we played each other a bunch of stuff you know it's like here's uh-huh. something here's another thing all right i like it what's the next you know what yep. else you got you know and then, we, and then that first very first night which was our pre-pro before we started tracking mm-hmm. on day two was just sitting in our kitchen of the studio and just playing the songs and figuring out what parts we cut out and how do we make it more succinct and how is it more interesting and that's the very beginning like making an album is a a whole lot like building a house and you have to figure out your structure first so you got to put it on your foundation and that's not the fun part like the fun part is after you've built you know this wonderful frame you can start painting and you do all the things that make to be fair it also kind of sounds like the fun part the way you describe it. I'm I mean, sure it's... it does, but it's just like, you know, I was at a Yankees game last night and this guy's like the head lawyer for the Yankees. I was like, that must be amazing. He's like, yeah, yeah. everybody else thinks my job's amazing. It's fucking terrible. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but I guess just from the standpoint of like being in a room with a good friend and kind of workshopping this. It is. It, on paper, it's amazing. In, rea- in reality, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's 12 yeah. hour days working really, really hard yeah. on really, really sensitive material that you're trying not to offend your friend you know by saying how here's what if we do this okay. and how we do right. this and it's tough they're real you do you have to shoot things down and of course yeah, yeah. We, we turn over every rock yeah you need both seem like reasonably tactful fellows we but... are tactful when we say them for sure <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but also not indirect which i think is useful no one's like no one's like um maybe you should yeah, try yeah, yeah, yeah. i think the third verse is lacking we should yes cut it yeah And then it's like, let's do that. And I don't know, I'm at this point in my life in general, I'm sort of wired to try to listen Mm. to things and not react from a place of like, my feelings are Yeah, the guttural instinct. Particularly in a creative environment, because there is no like, unless you're in there with somebody who's like, and I've almost never been in this circumstance, somebody who's just like being like weirdly malicious, Mm -hmm. then everything is just in service of like trying to make something the best it can be. And I don't always know what that is just because I think I, I have my own preconceptions about things, but that doesn't mean I'm always right. This is the third album. We've worked together. You know how each other works. You know that nobody's trying to outdo you. In the no, situation. no. And you know, like we spend a lot of time talking to each other about our own stuff that we work on mm-hmm. while we're working on it. Mm-hmm. You know, like so it's 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 once you decide that the song is what matters, not the person who wrote the song or the the idea it came from or whatever mark you're going to leave on it, then all of a sudden it becomes this wonderful collaborative process where you go like whatever wins wins, whatever mm-hmm. idea is best wins. And I would prefer to be in a room with someone who's smarter than me Mm -hmm. and better than me at everything all the time, because that would just make the stuff grow better, you know? So yeah, that's, that's been a big part of the kind of growing process of the band and and our working relationship with Mm -hmm. each other. It's just like, I'm never going to like, Kevin couldn't write the greatest, if you, if you wrote the greatest verse of your life, there would never be a part of me that's like, that's too good. (laughs) We have to make that worse. Right, you know, like that right. can't be better there, than There's me. no sabotage happening. No, of course yeah. not. It needs to be, um, it all needs to be helped and, and like watered. Mm-hmm. Like, like a, like a Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. You get together, you work on the first record. It sounds like, I suspect there's an expectation that the second record is coming pretty soon because there was only a, what, a year or two gap between those? I don't know why that happened. We just I did we that. We just did it. There was no rhyme or, the truth is, there has been no rhyme or reason really to any of any this. Of I agree. Not the musical part. That's yeah. intentional. But why we do it, when we do when it. When we do it. Yeah. yeah. No, there was no, I don't know why we made one so quick. It's funny to think of that. That to me feels more anomalous uh-huh. than us having taken seven years between two of them. Yeah, you true. almost feel like that would make more sense. I think we felt... Probably like there was some unfinished business. Like we just started. Like the last two yeah. songs that we did on Bad Books One were a song called Holding Out the Laughter. The second was Baby Shoes. And those were the first, like, in my mind, real full band songs mm-hmm. that we had accomplished that were collaborative. So when we did those two, it was sort of a, a sense of like, yeah, we, we should go do it again. And we had just finished Simple Math. You had just done Concrete. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. it, was, it was time. There was like a little break. And then I think when we had, when the next yeah. two years, when the next two year renewing of the lease mm-hmm. or whatever came mm-hmm. up, we were between, they were Cope and Hope and I was Bubblegum and Bulldozer. And I think we were both like, let's just chill for a minute. And let's then, work on the thing that we do primarily. Day job. And then, it's interesting though that you put it 
when, when you sort of pinpoint the time, it's the records that were in yeah. between. I mean, did that feel like a time in your life or in your career where this wouldn't have made sense? Not really. No, <laughs> not in an active way. Yeah. I think we'll also like somewhere in there we start like having kids. Yeah. There was some, some life stuff. Yeah. But there was also, but nothing like just more like, I don't know. It just kind of seemed like, no, we'll just like chill <laughs> for a minute we with this. We did the timeline. We did something in 2012 and then we made a song together in 2015 that we thought would have been the beginning of something. We ended up not releasing that song. Then you get into Instigator. We get into Black Mile. And throughout that, you're doing this, the, we, like the you Swiss did the Swiss Army, did the, yeah. like two rounds of the splits. There, right. there was just always stuff. But there was always the expectation that... Oh, that yeah. Was not the end. We knew. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, I don't think we're ever going to stop unless something terrible happens in our friendship yeah. for some ungodly reason. But, yeah. like, I don't ever expect to not make a Bad Books album. But no. what's so cool about it and why this album sounds the way it does, like, we're never going to make this album again. It's it's similar to the way I look at Manchester it's, and just creatively in general. Like, we can't repeat ourselves. And so if we went and made another indie pop record, that's just not interesting to me. Mm. I think it would be probably more interesting to a record label if you like come up with another Forrest mm -hmm, Whitaker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a hard line to walk though, right? You don't want to overthink it. You sort of want the songs to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. You want to see where they land. Well, and the album should speak for itself. Yeah. You're like looking at a, I don't know, it's like a, it's a, your IMDb Body. page. What's your filmography? Mm -hmm. what, did you, what did you work on? How much did it matter to you? It's like this record felt like the only real way at this point in our lives we can make something that I felt really substantially like fulfilled. Where are you guys in your life? that this is the record that made sense? Well, I think the two of us as songwriters have not made an album like this, specifically together, but just on our own. Yeah, uh, like not purely like, I don't want to use, because it isn't a, an acoustic record or a folk record. There's so much it's rich. sonically. It's full, that's yeah. good to hear. That's what, That was the goal. And also rich in a way that was slightly skewed. Yeah. Left not just like, um. it's not like a bunch of you know acoustic and wood instruments in a barn and we just put them there's like some kind of warped sound scapey cinematic stuff happening there are not like drums or bass guitar on the record it's pretty there are certain things aesthetically not that there were rules but that end up being like approaches mm -hmm. to kind of keep it widescreen rather than like tall you set parameters for yourself i think so but the parameters also were not like restrictive by setting some of those we we're able to explore like a million other yeah. colors we might not have necessarily essentially that just isn't there's not going to be drums. On That's that. really about it. How connected those are those to the songs themselves when you sit down and decide, you know, you don't want drums and you want, you want an organ instead. Does that come out of the songs that you pulled together? I think that with this one, there was like, I said this, you know, I feel like when you write the kinds of songs and whatnot that we're, we, we do different things, but there are, there's some, there's enough similarity sure. in the DNA. I know how to turn any, almost any song I write into, into a, a rock song, song, of course. But I don't always know how to, or I don't always think that you can turn a killer full band song into a devastatingly compelling and direct stripped song or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. I think that's harder and to make it as compelling as, as, as possible and as um, dynamic as possible. And I think this record, these songs, there's a couple songs on the record that we could have treated a certain way and made them like that song myths made plain could have been like a pop, an indie pop song. I, mean, I think we could have, if we wanted to, that's what I mean. Every yeah. song into something. Of course. Even when we did the thing at shaky knees, we were able to do that. To whatever extent, and it was great. Strokesify that song a little yeah. bit. I mean, you're, you're no stranger from doing two different versions of the same record. I was going to say, like, <laughs> yeah, we like we, we. I went through that process of like taking gnarly songs that were written mm -hmm. as rock songs and turning them into it. Yeah, and that's that was a fun, wild process. This felt totally different than that. This was almost like uh, as simplistic as we could make it. Play as little as you can on guitar, you know. Like even mm -hmm. even when we were doing our Leads and stuff. Our, our tracks of the live takes, because eight of the ten songs are all built on just four from you and four from me. Live takes, just mm -hmm. mic and the guitar, and then how do you expand on that? With Cope and Hope, it was more of like how do we strip all of that stuff and then figure out a new life of this song mm -hmm. how does that work this was more like an addition sometimes subtraction you know you do what you can to kind of, kind of get the song where it, where it would be but very 
cautiously adding stuff. Like we love the way they sounded alone. So how do you do stuff without overdoing it? Maintain the spirit of that. Exactly. And add the right things. I heard someone describe the songwriting process and, you know, saying that a good song is one that, you know, you can play with minimal instruments. So you could just sort of play on an acoustic guitar and the idea of it still stands. That almost has to be the case by the nature of the project, mm -hmm. right? And that you're presenting it to a room full of people. Mm -hmm. So you have to have something that can stand on, it, on its own. And because it can stand on its own, it's, it's malleable. Mm -hmm. I think there are all kinds of different definitions of all of those words. But I think that for, for, for me, for how I... Uh, what what a song feels like in the middle of my head is informed by the things I heard growing up. There's Beatles damage in there. There's all that <laughs> stuff in there. But then there's also as a kid growing up around the, the culture of MTV Unplugged and stuff like that, seeing all of that, but also growing up around like the hardcore and punk bands I knew were yeah. also people that really like sort of weirdly prized the purity of a kind of folk music yeah. because of that intensity. Like I knew a ton of hardcore kids that really liked Phil Oaks and stuff like that. And they Yoko were, Ono apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But something about that delivery, yeah. something about that. And then I think that... Sincerity and... And commitment. Yeah. And I think that for me, seeing Elliot Smith play when I was 18 acoustic, and he did all kinds of things. He did so, he was so, you know, we talk about that till our, we lose yep. our voices about his ability to arrange and build out and play every instrument and hear symphonies and all that stuff. But I watched that guy whenever I saw him play and I, saw, I got to see him play a bunch of times. I kind of always liked it when I just watched him with his guitar. Doesn't mean I don't always think, I don't love all of what he did in the studio, but the, but... And there was something from that that was like reaffirming all this childhood information that was like, oh, I just kind of, I want to see all kinds of things done with songs, but it'll always get me if someone can just sit there and communicate. I feel the same way about way. Towns Van Zandt. I don't oh, know if you yeah. Guys are fans, sure. But like, it doesn't come through on the studio albums. There's something Not the about same way. Those, the live records totally. with just him and the guitar. Yeah. And Dude, I was a kid searching my favorite rock bands on Kazaa or Napster and going like acoustic version. How yeah. Can I the acoustic yeah. Version? How can I hear Dave Grohl play Everlong? Acoustic? And that's something you want to hear when you're when you're learning to play guitar, right? And that's you want to hear what the element, yeah, the, the periodic so, table sounds like. Yeah. The first single is, uh, it's about your kid. We, I, we released, yeah, there was a song called I Love You, I'm Sorry, Please Help Me, Thank yeah. You. And we kind of co-released that with a song called Lake House. And then I guess uh, the next song is a song called UFO. But my that I Love You song is, I guess that's the way to say it. Yeah, it yeah. is about loosely, it's, it's about my kid and it's about her dad. <laughs> it's about figuring out Which how to be her dad. Is you, as far as we that know. That is my, as yeah. far as I'm aware, it is me. It's yeah, pretty yeah. clear. It's pretty clear yeah. that I'm her dad? <laughs> yeah, like, it's like... And well, she looks exactly like you. Yeah. And your wife. So yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> She's mine. What's that process like? I mean... Having a kid? No, oh, no, no. I mean, if you want. But yeah. We're um, going to have to put a, an explicit tag on this one. Yeah. What makes you sit down and decide that's what you want to write about? I am not always... I am not always... I can do it. But I, I'm not always the best at sitting down and deciding I'm going to. I mean, in kind of like co-writing situations, that's different. But for me, it's still often like either it's like, um, what's it called? Free writing, subconscious mm -hmm. throat clearing that then becomes something. Or it's like just sitting something guitar. shows yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And for me, sometimes like I'm not like an avid runner. I run when it's warm and pretty mm -hmm. nice out. I run outside because I don't like a treadmill and I don't use headphones. And I just like three or four miles a couple of days a week. But that's like a half hour that I can like not be on in the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And some clarity of thought comes. And songs now come for me with that but that was one that arrived from that and we've talked that there was a there was um i heard someone say that phrase this woman mora <laughs> said that phrase i love you i'm sorry please help me thank you as like a prayer and a way that she was like rooting herself like a meditation or yeah like a mantra yeah apparently someone actually at Loma Vista, the one that I met was telling me it's like from a Hawaiian thing. I've heard it in a few different contexts and I started singing it on in my head on this run and I started, it started to kind of attach itself to a few different trains of thought. But the, the basic through line was like, my kid was maybe three or four months old and my brain had exploded from that experience as you are aware. And then, in a, I mean, in all these beautiful ways that I was like, oh, I didn't even know I could feel this way. Yeah. And then also like in like these ways where I was like, 
Oh, I'm like acutely, I wasn't anxious about taking care of her, but I was anxious about like her living in the world. (laughs) And I was anxious about her living in the world with me as her dad a little bit too, because of the parts of myself that still the wrinkles and knuckles in my head. So I was trying to like figure out how to clear enough space in me to do the best job that I could to be deserving of the job. That thing kept coming back that I love you. I'm sorry. Please help me. Thank you. Thing. Obviously you guys have been in touch and have talked in the intervening like six or seven years. This is the first time I've seen him. Oh really? In, in, in about five the years. The entire thing was at Everest. <laughs> God, I changed my name since the last time I saw him. But, <laughs> but again, as you said earlier, you know, life, yes. life happened. You're very different people. I mean, you know, you've got families now and mm-hmm. things are really different than they were five, six, seven years yes. ago. Do you feel like that shows in, in the process of making music, parenthood and Surely. all the stuff that's intervened? Yeah. It's like, I can't find the right analogy for it. I've been trying to think of it all day. It's almost like you're injected with something and now you're this. It's like, mm. you're like Spider-Man. Hey, let's, let's call it Spider-Man. Yeah. Like you're bitten by the spider. And, and now no matter, no matter what you do, you have these certain abilities and instead of abilities, let's call them like great overwhelming fears uh-huh. and also great overwhelming love. Yeah. Um, and they just are a part of it now. Mm-hmm. It's like a, a new set of glasses that's put on you and now, like welded and to you your, can't, yeah. yeah, they're sewn into your skin and you can't take them off. So yeah, it's, of course it's, it's that it's the, it's, and, and that line in particular was something that Kevin had shared with me on a tour we were on two months before my daughter was born yeah, in 2014 right. and as a guy who is you know a god-fearing man as best as i can be that line crushed me and so it was something it had to be a bad book song like that, yeah. that that song had to be because there was such a moment we had it was like you were setting up for sound check before the show in boston and mm-hmm. he tells me this line i'm walking up the steps and i get to the the dressing room and i walk back on the balcony and just yell to you like hey <laughs> That really fucked with me. I just cried in the stairwell. That's a really good line. I remember, I, I, you know, I don't know if that, I have not seen Mora since the day, I, as a person I knew through um, a neighborhood I used to live in and a group, group of people that I, I, I would see. We were never especially close. I always liked her a great deal, but mm-hmm. I, I don't know if she knows that she said something once <laughs> in passing that I've thought of every day 500 times a day totally. since she said it. I love stuff like that. Oh, she me knows. too. Oh, she knows. Oh, she knows. You know. Mora. Mora. I suspect, and, and not being a parent my, myself, but I think this just also just comes with kind of age and responsibility and all these other things, mm-hmm. is that, that that time becomes more precious. It puts into perspective doing the things that you want to do. One of them being, I don't know, perhaps a band that hasn't put a record out mm. in seven years. It might be time to get back together and work on something. I think that my relationship to time has become so rubbery and weird yeah. since she was born where I feel like there's this very, very apparent, I'm not breaking any molds with this analysis, but that like, if it is an accordion, I am not the accordionist. Mm-hmm. Like there's days where I feel like I'm like something that happened 15 years ago can feel like it's right here. Mm-hmm. Something that happened two weeks ago. I'm like, when it was like 20 years ago. Right. And it kind of, I'm not in control over that. I do feel like I dropped my daughter off at daycare at 830 blink and Lucky. I'm picking her up at 445. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's like I drop her off so I can like do the rest of my life in that time. Yeah, I understand. It's just, I wish we had daycare. I, I understand too. We said kids at home just screaming all the time. <laughs> yeah. Dad, stop playing your music. <laughs> I don't want to hear it anymore. But I do feel like I don't know what happens in the yeah. course of a day. But anyway, with respect to like, I don't even know if we thought about that that consciously. If it was like, we need to make this record because time is slipping away. Not at all. No, it was more, I, I think ultimately question, if i could take your your question i think it's more about making sure that you're spending your time valuably yeah yeah and that's ultimately what it comes down to so when we're together we've always done that i think it's just a little bit more responsibly now like there's there's a little bit more of a focus a thought of like mm-hmm. we were saying earlier it's like back in the day i was working from 2 p.m to 4 a.m now it's 9.30 a.m. Mm-hmm. to 9.30 p.m. Yeah. You know, and you get back and you're able to like wake up. And I, sl- I sleep very well. In my at home. At the whole home. I know I you do. do. It drives me crazy. I know. I know. I know it does. It drives I know. me wild. I have to get up with the kids. I know. I get up and Kevin's just upstairs snoozing. I know. You feel mm. guilty. But I don't feel guilty you enough don't to know. not get you, up. No, exactly. <laughs> Why would you? They're not your children. With all of all this in mind, do you think, do you think you're going to let another seven years go by before... I would doubt it. 
I would doubt it. But if it is seven, we're going to make sure it's like interesting enough to be worth seven more years, I guess. Agreed. But there's no way. It's I, I don't even... Well, and that's the thing. I really do think that it was an. It was almost like accidental. Because mm-hmm. really, that record came out the tail end of 2012. We toured a bunch in 2013. Yeah, we did. We did US stuff. We did some festival stuff. And then something I forgot about was there was like an asterisk amend, uh, addended to that. We did a handful of bad book shows with Manchester and me. That's right. In, in the UK. Yep. And so it wasn't ever like the project yeah. was like so out of, and also anytime I've toured with Manchester or sometimes when like Andy's been in New York playing a show or I've been in Atlanta playing a show, we'll like jump up and do yes. a bad book song mm-hmm. together. So in some ways it had Australia. Kept, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Yeah. So I kind of feel like even though it has been seven years since that release date, it really is six years since the cycle for that record wound down. And we've been like inter- intermittently doing stuff. I also think, stuff. and tell me if you think this too, but I feel like I'm a part of Instigator. I feel oh. like you're a big part of Black Mile. Like there's a there's a lot of discussion and thought and demos and lyrics. Mm. Like we were constantly sending things back and forth with each other that are... You know, in, like we've in heard arguably, all of it. You know, in arguably, we've heard the baby parts of every song I've done. I've heard the baby parts mm-hmm. of every song you've done since the second Bad Books album. Mm-hmm. Continuously, because it's, this is a great, it's a mirror with with great advice and yeah. encouragement that we both like throw it against and go like, am I losing my mind? Is this good? Is this good? You know? yeah. It's super, is this good? It's super, is this a thing? Yeah. That, I, it's it's, uh, it's very true and it's also I also love how we used to really like say it we used to preface all these songs that we send to each other really kindly hey man when you get a second you know, like, <laughs> like oh. if you have it now yeah. it's like listen yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. here so, yeah tell me it's true <laughs> and it's well that's that's the benefit of like knowing someone mm-hmm. long enough and trusting them to be like alright I can skip that whole part yeah but I yeah. also feel like it's funny like I have this I have like a Rain Man thing about dates I remember like your touring schedule sometimes for tours like i wasn't on on, because of how much of that back and forth there is or like when you guys did a recording project or when and i remember like nate our tour manager and good friend one day being like how do you remember all that shit i was like i don't know it's actually a little like maybe it's somewhat sad i have the same thing i can remember all of it yeah every date like put it in here's where it all exists yeah Yeah. but i definitely do feel that way i feel like you guys are so you are so present in all of that stuff that on some level it kind of all just feels like one big thing i agree it wears a few different faces There you go. That was Kevin Devine and Andy Hull of Bad Books. Their new record, Three, is out June 14th on Luma Vista Records. Andy, of course, had appeared on the show before as part of Manchester Orchestra. Got a year or two back. I don't know. It was a bullet bourbon promotional event, so there was a lot of whiskey being exchanged. Thanks so much to them for taking the time to do that. Thanks to Chromatic for helping set it up. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the program. If you like the show, there are a number of ways to support us. You can rate and review us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Podcast. We're on Spotify and YouTube now. If you have any feedback, it's rlcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Tumblr. That's rlcast.tumblr.com. Like us on Facebook. And that's about all we got for now. So stick around because we're going to be back in a few days with another episode of RIYL. 